Right. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, Monday, September 11th, 2017, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can the roll call from the clerk, please? Chairman Garvin? Here. Councilor Grennan? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Councilor Ray? Here. And Councilor Sullivan? Here. Thank you. Um, before we get to the uh, reports and correspondence and the rest of the agenda, I wanted to take a brief minute. Um, as I mentioned, it being September 11th, I felt it was appropriate for us to acknowledge that today. Um, so today marks 16 years since the horrific and tragic events of 9-11. There are times when that day feels like it was just yesterday, and others when it feels like a lifetime ago. But it is important that we stop and remember the loss our nation experienced on that beautiful September morning, honor the lives of those who perished, and recognize all who continue in the service of our country to protect our liberties and freedom. I have previously remarked about how, while the terrorist attacks wreaked death, injury, and destruction, one of my lasting memories from that time is the feeling of unity and hope that brought our country together in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy. Americans coming together as one in the face of adversity is something that is not all that unusual. We have to look no further than recent weeks in Texas and Florida to see just that. But not in my lifetime do I recall a time when regardless of who you were, where you were from, and what you believed, for an all too brief moment, disagreements were set aside, people sought to help one another, and lift each other up rather than tear people down. As a community here and as a nation, I hope we, that we continue to strive to uphold that spirit as a lasting legacy and living tribute to all those who were lost on that fateful day. And with that, I ask that you all join me and pause for a moment of silent reflection. Thank you. We go to correspondence and reports, please. Jessica. Uh, I uh, continue to represent the town and the Metro Coalition of Governments through under uh, Greater Portland Council of Governments and still involved with uh, the uh, regional homelessness issue and um, I'm working on a presentation for Metro Coalition that will probably be given in a couple months. And also, I was um, interestingly elected <laughs> uh, to serve on the county Cumberland County Finance Committee. I think that's the right. Yep. Uh, uh, Matthew was there witnessing this event, <laughs> which will be very interesting. And actually, I'm delighted to have the chance to learn more about how the county budget is created because I have complained for quite a while that that is a cost that. Go, has been going up very high over you know, over many years, and I don't really understand why. So I'm about to learn all that, and I'll be reporting back to you all. Thank you very much. Any questions for Jessica? Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for hearing that. Condolences. Other correspondence or reports? Penny? I'd like to just... Uh, uh, continue to remind people about the comprehensive plan work that is going on um, and uh, we're hoping to engage as many people from the community as possible and so if people would go on to the Cape Elizabeth website under hot topics and uh, select comprehensive plan you can go and um, join a group it's a online um, conversation and uh, this week's uh, question I believe is about um, job creation in Cape Elizabeth and so it would be great if uh, people could go participate it's uh, uh, currently there's uh, 65 members with 95 that are kind of pending uh, so if we could get uh, like over a thousand it would be fantastic so if we could go to the website and join the group it would be great thank you very much any questions for Penny any other reports, correspondence? I just want to make mention of the fact that next Monday night uh, here at Town Hall we'll have a joint meeting with the Fort Williams Park Committee 
um, first of what we expect to be several discussions around um, ongoing vision and strategy and issues uh, pertaining to the park. Um, so I want to make sure everybody's aware of that. 7 o'clock Monday uh, next on the 18th. So. Anybody else? Seeing none, over to Matt for monthly report. Let's join, join the, uh, the dashboard. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Dude, thank you very much. Sorry, yep. sorry, sorry. Yep. No, that's okay. You all have Keep your dashboard in front of you. Um, and uh, things continue to look uh, very well. Um, excise taxes are <laughs> continue to uh, bring in quite a lot of revenue. I'm going to ask Matt to mention, to discuss uh, cable franchise fees and a couple other items. I left him a message today, so I'm going to this point, give it over to you, Matt. Thank you, Councilor Sullivan. Uh, there's a couple different areas. We are still uh, tracking, uh, we're still waiting, I guess, to receive our final payment relative to last year's cable franchise fee. Uh, I continue my calls on there, but I think I may end up uh, working with the town's attorney to see if we may need to exert a little stronger pressure on that. I mean, it's just, it's not a large amount of money, but it's enough that uh, it's, a, it's a point of principle that I think they should be paying. Uh, and they'll be uh, bringing their payments forward this year. Right now we're tracking zero just, just because we haven't received the first installment for this year. Uh, as Councilor Sullivan said, the excise taxes do continue to, to move in a positive direction, which is a good thing. Uh, there are a number of purchases that are, uh, are according to, uh, uh, down in the collection office this morning, I was hearing from Terry Olson uh, talking about the number of purchases that are taking place out of state and folks are bringing in their automobiles and registering them here. So. Uh, and pe many people are buying out their leases, but still our, our numbers still seem to track fairly strongly when it comes to excise taxes, which is a positive trend. Uh, building permits as well uh, are still uh, maintaining last year's pace. Uh, we thought last year was going to be a robust, uh, was a robust year where we exceeded significantly by what we had projected uh, due to some larger projects, but we do have, uh, if you pay attention to the planning board agenda for next week, they have seven projects on next week's agenda, which is uh, according to Maureen, the, the largest uh, single agenda that she's had in all of her years working here, and that's and the weight of the uh, uh, projects coming forward are fairly significant. Uh, so I, I think we can anticipate our building permit fees to keep moving forward, and our sewer fees are up as well. And that's uh, after speaking with Bob about that. Uh, that's primarily due to new construction that's been taking place, uh, with Eastman Meadows being one of the larger contributors to that as well as if Maxwell's Woods comes on this year, uh, we'll see some additional uh, revenues that will be coming to that from the connection fees. Um, and our state school subsidy, you'll, not, you'll notice that that as a number itself, current year to date, is down from last year. That's due in part to the reduction that we did receive from last year to this year. However, we are tracking a little bit greater when it comes to it as a percentage to this year's budget. Uh, we do anticipate that we'll, we'll We'll have that staggering through as the year goes along. And there are no, uh, after speaking with Catherine, there are no school financial news updates to provide, uh, but that's just because they just started school last week. But they, we will anticipate uh, notable events, hopefully in a positive way, uh, as, the, as the next few months unfold. Right. I think that was the length of it. Right. Yep, and the only other thing I wanted to ask you about on the financial report was just to update the council on the <clears throat> fund of Portland Water District and sewer connection fees. And I mean, you've already touched on part of that, but I think that, um, uh, you know, with our sewer fund, you know, we, that's something we have to keep our eye on and it's a high ticket item. We do, we do, especially with this year. We do have some expenditures that will be coming out of it this year with the improvements that we have uh, going forward in the town center. Uh, but uh, but here we are, we are, that is something that we do need to maintain a, uh, an eye on, I guess would be the best way to put it. Thank you, Matt. Yep, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Any questions for Jessica? Great, thank you very much. Anybody here? Looking to speak on anything not on our agenda? No. Uh, so now we'll go over to Matt for the monthly report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. As we transition from summer to fall, new programming is beginning at Community Services and at the Thomas Memorial Library. Uh, please refer to the town's website for more information. Uh, for example, tomorrow night at the TML, uh, there will be a, a discussion group 
over the portrait of Dorian Gray. And if you remember the story at all, that's a, it's a fairly fascinating story, but they will be having a discussion group uh, tomorrow night, so uh, there's more information about that online, as well as the uh, community services programming that starts this week. So uh, they've been fairly robustly uh, subscribed to, uh, so things are going very well for that, but uh, there are still opportunities for folks to, to pursue if they're looking for recreation and uh, other type of activities. The Hillway Scott Dyer project is uh, progressing with substantial work underway this week on Hillway. Uh, please be advised that now that school is in session, morning traffic is facing some challenges, specifically around pickup and drop off time. So please leave some additional time for getting through this section of town, particularly in the morning where it seems to be more acutely uh, felt. I have some very good news. In today's mail, the town received a dividend check from the Maine Municipal Association in the amount of $16,875 as a result of our good loss experience and loss prevention programs. Uh, this is a result of our low loss ratio for the MMA Workers' Compensation Fund and the MMA Property and Casualty Pool. It's a direct result of our successful risk management activities and good loss experience. So that's a great way to start off the week. The Comprehensive Planning Committee, as Councillor Jordan had stated, uh, is very busy and they uh, last week mailed out a survey to all condominium owners in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, roughly 337 surveys, I believe, were, were mailed out. Uh, it's the first of a number of surveys that will be performed and they were mailed out last week and the Planning Department is already receiving a good return rate. So I think they just received 22 in the mail today. So. That's a good start. There will be an additional larger survey uh, that should be coming out shortly, uh, so, and that will be online uh, with a, a mailer that will be going out to the all town residents to avail themselves of their opportunity to provide input. Finally, I'd like to take a moment, as, Council, as uh, Chairman Garman had, uh, had stated, to take a moment to remember the lives lost on September 11, 2001. Our country was forever changed as a result of the tragic events that took place that day, and our military has been fighting the war on terror ever since. We want to thank them and all of our first responders, firefighters, police officers, and the many other groups and organizations that are protecting us in our way of life. Respectfully submitted. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions for Matt? Great. Um, <clears throat> First up, we're going to have a presentation from Todd Robbins, new tree warden. First of all, welcome. Glad to have you. Um, so uh, in the continuing um, spotlight that we put on the winter moth problem, I uh, appreciate you being here and look forward to your presentation. Cape Elizabeth Tree Warden. Uh, my full-time position is the Assistant Property Manager at uh, Raymond Farm for the Spray Corporation. Um, not too many people are able to say they're working two dream jobs at the same time, but I am. Um, I take it very seriously. I take the position as Tree Warden very seriously, so um, if there's any doubt that, you know, uh, that side of the uh, town is being taken care of, it is, because uh, I care very greatly for it and, you know, my position with the Sprague Corporation as well. Um, I've been with the uh, Sprague's for 13 years, so I'm very familiar with uh, what I'm going to talk about, the winter moth. Um, I've taken down many trees that have succumbed to the winter moth epidemic. Um, I We'll give you some information factual. I'll maybe throw some uh, opinion in there. And that opinion is based on um, my experience to this point, my schooling to this point. Um, and, but I'm always learning. Um, I'm not God of tree. I, you know, I have more experience than you know, most. Um, but every, if it is an opinion, uh, take it with a grain of salt. So. Um, so behind you, uh, a little uh, winter moth identification. Uh, the first figure, the one on the left, uh, that is the adult uh, male moth. 
That's what you're going to see um, late November into December on warm uh, winter nights. A lot of people have seen this uh, as they're driving at dusk uh, in their uh, car headlights. Uh, you now some people have claimed it looks like falling snow. Uh, so when you do see that, if you see that, um, begin looking at some of the trees that I'm going to go uh, through later, uh, preferred hosts for the winter moth, and you'll see the figure in the middle, uh, which is the female. And the female uh, is wingless, is flightless, uh, looks like a cricket almost. Um, and if you go up to the uh, tree and look at the base of the tree, you'll see those. So when you are seeing these two, the first and the second, the mating process is uh, ongoing. Um, and again, uh, weather has a lot to do with that, so um, we have had some warm winters here, um, and obviously a lot of activity. So the figure on the right, that is the uh, winter moth caterpillar. That's what everybody's been seeing. Um, early spring, there is a temperature 53 degrees when the, um, at bud break, when you begin seeing these caterpillars. And um, I started this job uh, around that time, I think around April 1st to the 15th, and people were seeing this, and I got a lot of calls right off the bat. What do I do, what do I do? Um, so uh, these are the little guys that eat the buds, they eat the flower buds, they eat the leaf buds off the trees. They pretty much strip them uh, when the density is high. This is a uh, timeline. Um, what I'll do is I'll start at the top right um, when the adult moths are in the trees and around lights. Uh, we're talking a uh, November through a January time frame that you can possibly see this, the activity that I spoke of earlier. Um, this is when the mating process is going on. Um, Hopefully, this is when I, uh, you know, I'm a one-man show here, so hopefully residents will um, call me, let me know what they're seeing, so I know where um, the concentration is in town, uh, because it's become quite uh, widespread, uh, from, you know, Scarborough all the way to South Portland, so. Uh, in February and March, and on through April, uh, into April, the eggs on the bark and on the leaf buds. So uh, the females have laid their, uh, their eggs all over the preferred trees. Um, so, you know, if you're going to do something, uh, you know, a preventative uh, measure that I'll touch on later, that's when you would, uh, you would do that. Uh, so larvae eating the leaves, um, we're going to say it's through April through uh, June, mid to late June. Uh, again, when the temperatures are around 53 degrees and on through mid to late June, um, they're eating on the leaves and uh, possibly falling on you and falling on vehicles, so you're, you're going to see the caterpillars around. Um, after they've eaten, what they do is they spiral out of the trees into the soil and they pupate into the ground and um, form cocoons, uh, they, which is the last item. And that would be May all the way through November. That is a winter moth cycle. And then it just starts all over again. Any questions so far? I have questions, but I'll, sure. wait, I'll wait to the end. Okay, okay. absolutely. These, this is a list of preferred hosts for uh, winter moth. Uh, oaks, maples, ash trees, elm trees, and a wide variety of fruit trees. Um, also, because we have some in town, it's not on the list, but Zelkovas, uh, they're also a preferred host. And Zelkovas, um, after the Dutch elm disease, Zelkovas kind of became the uh, 
possible replacement and kind of have the same form and take on the same characteristics of Elm. So we do have some in town and they also could be added to this list. Now this, um, actually that's one of my favorite pictures. That's on the Island Farm. That's a shag bark hickory and uh, to the back to the left that's an American Elm. That's a true American Elm. So I, I love that. Uh, but what we're looking at here on the left, um, I've kind of inundated you with native genus uh, substitutes, trees that can be used um, that are not host for winter moth. And if you kind of just scroll through that list, it probably doesn't mean a lot to you. And that's kind of what I wanted to feel like, uh, just kind of an overwhelming, like I've never heard of these trees before because um, those trees should be uh, known to you as much as a red oak or a Norway maple or a red maple. Um, somewhere along the line, we stopped planting these native genuses. And um, there is a uh, there's a rule of thumb for arborists. Uh, it's called the 10, 20, 30, and it's a bit archaic. Um, but when planting within a municipality, uh, only 10% of your trees within a municipality uh, species, there should only be 10%. 20% of a genus and 30% of a given family. So to give you uh, an example, um, red oak. Red oak is a species. There should be only, uh, according to this, 10%. But revised, most people believe that there should be only 5%. Of, uh, of a species. We have over, in this town, over 40% of our woodland trees are red oak. So you go from the preferred 5% to, you know, 40% of the species. That's, that's incredible. So um, every tree that I put in, that I have put in, um, I've been I want native. And you may ask also, why, why is it so important that it's native? The reason it's so important to be native, in my opinion, is because if you plant native, it will never become invasive. Um, if you look up invasive, the first word that you're going to see is non-native. Um, landscape plants that have become the bittersweets and the honeysuckles and um, the multiflora roses, they were landscape plants at one time, um, uh, but they're not native and now they've become uh, invasive. So never will you see a tree planted by myself or by Public Works that will ever be on the list for uh, invasive. So there are more, there's more native genus substitutes that we can use and I would like them to become more of the repertoire of what we know um, because they're just as good of a tree as a red oak or a red maple um, we just have to kind of get that into our vocabulary a little bit, and I would like to kind of help that happen. So, um, very important. Cyzenus albicans. Now, this is the uh, parasitoid fly um, that you may or may not have heard of. Um, it is a non-native uh, fly that primarily feeds on winter moths. Its life cycle parallels winter moth, and there have been two releases of this at uh, Two Light State Park, which was pretty much ground zero for um, where this activity, had, uh, winter moth activity began. Um, I have not yet made contact with the person who did those releases. I will, um, but I'll also say that I'm, a, I'm the tree warden and I'm dealing with standing dead trees and, you know, I, I hope that this parasitoid fly does its job, but I also believe that maybe there need to be other releases considering that the epidemic is so widespread now. Um, so I'd like to actually, you know, encourage that to happen somewhere along the line. Um, that's what it looks like, um, and uh, again, two releases, and it maybe takes seven to ten years to actually get the 
winter moth population 30% under control. So that's where at what stage are they eating them at the moth stage or at the little wormy larva stage? Um, that's a good question. I, wrote, I believe I wrote that down. Uh, all stages. All of them. All stages. And then they, they live and die in the uh, same life cycle as a mental mom. And, and what are the, um, because many times there's a ripple effect when you, uh, when you introduce something that... Absolutely. And so once their f food source is done, what's their next? Exactly. Well, they, they perish. They're gone until their next life cycle. That's mm -hmm. it. Parallels. I had those same questions. I, I should know more about it. I don't. I'll find out. Okay. Um, okay. But again, until the season's over, standing dead trees are my primary concern. Mm -hmm. So um, it's definitely on my list to find out more and hopefully get more releases. I okay. Mean, uh, the one that, so I know a little bit, uh, not too many people breed these, or not too many organizations breed these. Um, it's become quite labor intensive. Uh, the competition to get these flies is there's a, a lot of competition, so um, we'll just have to see if we're able to, to make that happen. But uh, Mike Duddy, who's the previous tree warden, has kind of brought me up to speed on what he knows, and that's his information to me. So, and I respect his opinion and his knowledge greatly. This uh, integrated pest management. Um, integrated pest management is um, controlling uh, what what type of control you want to have for a given pest. And it doesn't mean integrated pest management doesn't mean wiping something out. It means managing it, keeping it at a manageable threshold. Because believe it or not, all insects um, are needed. Uh, you don't want to uh, completely get rid of anything. And why don't we want to get rid of the moth? Because we need the parasitoid fly. And that's what the parasitoid fly um, feeds on. Um, tree banding. Um, we're going to do a lot of tree banding. I've ordered 500 feet um, for uh, town trees. And uh, if, if we need to get more, we'll get more. Um, I had been telling people November 1st, to if they get uh, these tree bands uh, on uh, sheltertree.com. Uh, I've scaled it, I've pushed it ahead to November 15th uh, because the um, last year's hatch was after Thanksgiving and I wanna, if we put them up November 1st, I'm just afraid that weather, rain, uh, they'll get destroyed before they actually get a chance to work. So. Hopefully, if we're going to you know, spread the word, November 15th is when we want to start doing tree banding. Uh, landscape pork oils. These are um, oils that uh, any resident can go to a, um, a landscape uh, materials shop and buy. And they can apply the landscape oils to, a tr to the tree. And what it does is it kills the eggs. I'm going to tell you some pros and some cons of each of these. The um, con to the landscape oils is uh, these eggs are laid behind bark crevices in furrows, and it's very, very difficult to reach all these areas. So you're definitely not getting the majority of eggs laid. You're, you know, you're smothering the tree, but um, they're kind of they're microscopic. They're getting away. So. Um, Professional uh, spray. Uh, this is an option. I, we do some of the uh, rain on the farm. Uh, we do a little bit of all these. Uh, the problem with spray is uh, you kill everything. You kill the beneficials. You kill. Um, you're killing all the moths. You're getting rid of it. But um, you know, it's a spray. It gets other places. People worry about bees. The way I handle bees on uh, Raymond Farm is if somebody uh, 
has bees, I'll have them hide the bees overnight, spray first thing in the morning, and then after everything dries, they can let their bees, uh, they can release their bees again. Um, bees, just in nature, not much is blooming at 53 uh, degrees, so um, you're not gonna, you know, bees probably aren't gonna be around the trees at that point, so. Um, but again, you're killing everything, and that's not what you're trying to do in integrated pest management. You're trying to uh, just control the threshold for a uh, given situation. Uh, systemic injection. Uh, systemic is great. It's a shot uh, into the bark of the tree. Uh, it lasts multiple seasons. There isn't a time. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to back up a second. With the spray application, it has to be at mud, mud break. It has to be at 53 degrees. Um, so how many large companies do we have that do these sprays? You know, if everybody's getting sprayed, how are they all getting sprayed at the right time? They're probably not. Um, but the systemic, you can you could do it right now, and it would last multiple seasons. Uh, it's expensive. It's more expensive than a spray. Um, but and the other problem with the systemic is if there's any rot in a tree, uh, the Systemic will flatline. It will not move throughout the tree once it's hit uh, anything dead within the tree. So these are all options. Um, I just give information, and I'm not really prefer. Uh, I have no preference uh, to one or the other. Um, you're just trying to manage, and I think all of these do that. Uh, winter moth damage. Um, the photo on the right. It's hard to see. I mean, I'm sorry, the photo on the left, hard to see. I took that while I was uh, watching the Beach to Beacon, which was early August. Um, that's a red oak. Uh, you can't tell because the leaves are extremely tattered. Uh, this, so obviously, uh, this is in Fort Williams. Um, the one thing I'll say, and this is opinion, but I, I do stand behind it. Um, if all the winter moth did was tatter your leaves like that, we wouldn't have a problem. What is causing the problem is when there's a high concentration of winter moth, they completely strip the leaves off the tree, and then the tree forces out a second uh, growth of leaves in a given year. And when this happens three or four years in a row, um, that tree has used up all its reserves, and it will die. So, what I've seen around town this year, in my opinion, will not kill a tree. Everywhere. I have not seen, I've seen minimal second growth leaves on damaged trees this year. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a great thing, in my opinion, and I, I do stand behind that. Um, <coughs> little technical here, the inside of a tree, uh, it's called the xylem. It transports water throughout the tree. The exterior of the tree is called the phloem, and that is where the reserves are. And that, when I cut these trees down on the Ramon farm that are perished due to winter moth, the phloem, the nutrient reserve, is cork. And uh, I've tried to, you know, we process firewood. I haven't been able to use most of what I've cut down to be firewood because it's completely cork. Now, having said that, uh, what gives a tree its strength is the inner part called the heartwood. So a lot of these standing dead trees around here, um, I believe, you know, a dead tree is a dead tree. It's always in danger of coming down. But I also think that the fact that these are dying from the outside in they have more strength than a, a tree that has died from the inside. If that makes sense. Um, the photo on the right, you guys know that rock. Um, and behind it, uh, many, many uh, dead red oak trees. Um, Mike Duddy did tag many of these trees on Route 77 in Old Ocean House. Um, the ones that are stand, still standing are private homeowner trees. Um, so my mission after tree banding 
is to uh, get with every, figure out whose trees they are, get with every resident and do my due diligence in uh, convincing these people, whether it's walking outside and deciding which trees are at risk to um, public safety, can we get these trees taken down? Will you take these trees down? Um, and we'll see how that goes. But that, I'm kind of taking things incrementally here. Um, so I am going to do that. That's going to be more of my uh, wintertime thing. I'm just going to make sure that all these trees are still tagged so we know what trees are dead and which trees aren't. But I do want to talk to residents that own these trees so we can um, make this area safe again. And the reality is the trees that you can see that aren't public nuisance, they, they're just going to be, become part of the ecosystem. I mean, I, why would anybody take those down if they didn't have to unless they did it on their own? They're not going to pay to take them down. So, um, yeah. And this is my last slide. Uh, this is my uh, current management plan. I'll begin with the residential trees. Um, if I were to, uh, talking to a homeowner, I would ask them uh, to monitor, it should say monitor winter activity, so we know how concentrated or we can understand how concentrated uh, the uh, spring activity may or may not be. Um, use a preferred IPM measure, so I, if I talk to a, a homeowner, I'm telling them, I'm giving them their options of integrated pest management and allowing them, you know, obviously, to choose which they want to do. And hopefully, uh, I can encourage people to report their findings to the town or myself, the tree board. Uh, how's it going? What's the winter activity? Uh, if you've banned it, are you collecting uh, many uh, female moths? Just kind of give me a heads up, yes. I had, a, I had always done my reporting on the state's site. Sure. Uh, do you have access to their data? Do they send you or send us reports at all? Okay. No. 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 So, so I assumed that it was magically coming back here. So no. Yeah. Again, this, this is, I'm, I'm new to this. Okay. Um, maybe this is something that Mike has gotten in the past. Uh -huh. um, I don't know anything like okay. that. Okay. I'm kind of, I'm kind of just hoping people give me a heads up so okay. I know myself. Okay. And if there's somebody I need to be reporting to, well, I guess okay. I'll figure that out somewhere along the line too. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, town trees. So the trees that I am responsible for. Uh, I'm going to monitor w uh, winter activity. Um, tree banding, select areas. Um, I had a discussion last night with the trees that um, my buddy was thinking about uh, banding. I kind of like to stick to that plan. Uh, he was the tree warden for seven years, so again, I respect where he's coming from in, in all this. Um, I'm going to remove any hazardous uh, dead trees or limbs in town right of ways. And that is uh, town trees, not <coughs> private trees. Um, replace uh, trees that I remove with new native specimen that are not uh, affected by winter moth. Uh, we went over that slide. We have a lot to choose from. So. And I'm going to work with owners of private trees which pose threat of public roads, structures, or areas of activity. And that's what I spoke of on the slide before. Um, I'll do my best to see if we can get some of those removed. And that's all I have. Questions that you have, I'd love to answer. Go ahead. Sure. I think there's going to be lots. I was waiting. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, uh, where we live, we have thousands of these moths, thousands. And um, we also have mostly oaks. Sure. And so, um, a couple of questions um, the bands, and I think Mr. Malley had talked about this last year. Um, the bands are available where? Shelter tree. Dot com. Is All one word, shelter and tree. And that's not locally? It is not locally. Okay. But it's Massachusetts. And do you have any idea of the cost? Um, we bought uh, 500 feet. So you can buy 30 foot rolls. I'm not sure of the uh, cost of those. But the 250 
uh, foot rolls were about $800 to $850 delivered. So. Okay. Um, and you talked about um, invasive species and non-invasive species. Um, and I'm hoping that um, your presentation will be, maybe we can put this on the website on, you know, like a, a you know, like it scrolls up to the top because I think other people will want to know about this. But are you talking about, you're not talking about oaks versus something else or can you tell me about the invasive, invasive species? And what, what do you mean by invasive species? What, a, you know, a lot of people don't know what that means. Species. Yes, an yes. An invasive yes, species is a uh, non-native landscape plant that um, takes over and moves um, at, at its own will. Um, like an oak tree? Spreads. Like like an, an, well, um, so an acorn will sprout. Right. Correct. But it does not move invasively. And, an, and a red oak is native. Okay. That was actually in the article, I'm sure most of you guys had read. There's a lot that didn't come across in that article. And uh, it came across that I was saying red oak is not native, it is native. And uh, basically all I was saying was um, to use different, different specimens because we're trying, we'd like to see the percentages of red oaks and maples um, go down. Because we are finding out why you don't want 40% of a species in a municipality because if we lost all of our red oaks to a disease or an insect, how would the smell look? It would look very bare. You would not have a lot of most of the trees that we have, so. Thank you. So, okay. so with, um, we know that there's development going on in town and that um, in developments there's a certain number of trees that are uh, need to be planted. Are we going to come up with a list of trees that we encourage the developers are planting so that we are helping that transition? There is a street tree list and okay. I, I need Bob's help a little bit as to the ordinance or where they can find that. I believe that list was recently revised by Mike Duddy, maybe in the past couple of years, and I think they looked at invasives and looked at species that are tolerant or uh, not susceptible to Lincoln moth. So that's been updated fairly recently. Good. Good. Jessica? Um, thank you. It's thank great you. to meet you. Yeah, and nice uh, thank you very much. I, I was just pulling up the, the home page on the town website and just to piggyback on a couple of um, thoughts that have already been expressed. It might be a good idea for residents and for you as well if we had uh, a winter moth uh, bulletin under hot topics perhaps and also maybe a direct link in that to your town email so that residents can get a hold of you. Uh, with questions, and maybe sure. somehow uh, they could tell you if they reported, as Council Jordan, Penny Jordan said, to the state. So I, I always report to the state because yeah. I'm like surrounded Absolutely. every November. I was going to suggest to Wendy that we maybe have a little short yes. web form and work with her on developing that. That would be you know, just to, you know, yeah, with quick, people, quick fields and details right. and drop downs and stuff like that. So yeah. we, can, we can take a look at that. Residents have been able to reach me through the website. Have they, they have been okay. emailing me, they have been calling okay. me. So um, at first they were, you know, getting directed to me through uh, the public works office or a town hall or something. But it is on the website, like my cell phone number and my okay. email address. So people are finding that. Well, that's good. Yeah. I, I just, you know, it's not. You don't it's see it right away. Right. So maybe, you know, sure. yeah. Okay. Other questions? I, um, fantastic information, thank you. Um, so the um, average person probably doesn't know, you know, a lot of what we just went through. Exactly. Would you say that, um, you know, if, if folks are working on landscaping though, they're hiring professionals that that that's this this information you just shared with us is pretty well known in the sort of professional community about this or um, do we need to be doing a job to not only educate homeowners but also 
maybe some of the people they have doing the work for them? Well, definitely landscapers need to be um, schooled on this. Uh, I would say, and this is just a guess because I don't know, I would say the local landscapers do know um, about winter moth and have a reasonable understanding about it. Um, if you're a Cape Elizabeth resident and you have um, a company from Portland coming out, who knows? Uh, they don't have a winter moth problem there. And the other problem with that is um, a big reason this is spreading um, to Scarborough and to South Portland is because of movement of landscape materials. So when these uh, winter moth are, are pupating in the soil and the landscaper comes along and rakes up the soil and throws it on his truck and takes it to a, um, the transfer station, he, and, you know, that's processed into mulch or loam or something. The next person goes and picks up a, a truck bed of home and takes winter moth to their house. So um, it's not out of the question that, I mean, this could be happening in Portland um, and, and they just don't know it yet. Uh, if it's not that concentrated and the, tr the leaves aren't being that um, damaged, maybe they're just not noticing. But uh, landscape materials are a big reason why this is all of a sudden in the last uh, couple of years, it's there's, it's in pockets now, and that's how these winter moth act. Uh, I have some spots on uh, Raymond Farm uh, apple orchards that, you know, an apple orchard, I know that if I didn't protect it, it would get demolished. And then uh, you know, less than a mile up the road is another big uh, orchard, Spurring Farm. Maybe some of you know it. That has never been hit by winter moth, which is very odd. Mary Lou wanted to get that sprayed this year, Mary Lou sprayed, and I convinced her not to. I said, you know, if you can uh, just hold out and wait to see whether you get hit and you can, you know, that season you lose out on your, on your apples, then let's just wait and see. But, you know, that this is how it happens. It, it happens in pockets. And, um, you know, two blocks down, they may have a really bad case. And where you are, you may not have, a, have it. But, um, and I'll say it again, uh, you may have seen a lot of winter moth. Um, I believe in, uh, the other thing I do believe is possible is that now that it is as widespread as it is, maybe it's not as concentrated and maybe that's why um, I did not see any oaks being stripped. I didn't see any maples being stripped. Um, fruit trees, I think the fruit trees were having a little trouble this year, uh, this year anyway because of last year's drought. So if you've noticed, a lot of people were looking at leaves and just saying, you know, they, it's just not as full this year. I think a lot of that, that was not winter moth, that was drought. Um, because uh, a tree will show signs of drought the, fall, the year after uh, a drought year. So and we also had some drought this year, so we may have some weak trees next year as well. But uh, if you're not getting the tattered mm -hmm. skeletonized leaves, that is not winter moth. I have two other quick questions, but go ahead. Thank you. Um, you talked about different uh, IPM practices. Uh, one of the things I didn't hear you say, which you may have, when, they, the, um, when they're in the soil, are there applications that can be done at the soil level, or do you try to always catch them at the egg level? No, not that I know of. Okay. You had mentioned the um, deadwood in town, but there's both town trees as well as private property trees that may right. be in danger of um, causing damage. Sure. Do you know like what, uh, for both of those, do you know like what percentage or, or like how, how much volume are we talking about that, you, that you're having to deal with, both, both town trees that need to be dealt with and felled maybe, or also? Well, if you, if, for instance, and if this doesn't answer your question, I, I'd love to get to what you're talking about. Uh, before the beach to beacon, um, I cleaned up all of, I had uh, all of Old Ocean House Road cleaned up. I had all of the um, town trees that were dead because of went to moth, those were, were removed. Um, I had uh, town trees that needed to be pruned. I did not prune any uh, dead trees that were private trees, but everything that's still, that is still upright on Old Ocean House Road is private. So, um, and, uh, I would say a large percentage. 
I was just trying to get a sense of scale of how much work you have ahead of you with both of those things that you just outlined. Either, oh, either a lot. Yeah, that's. Yeah. 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 I would say I would say most are most of the trees are private, in my opinion. Um, and the reason I say that is because Mike did extensive work. Um, one, seeing if those trees were private trees or trees in the uh, town right away. So if you see the trees and they have little pink tags on them, those are private trees. <clears throat> My last question, and it's relating to the fact that we've got a meeting next Monday with the Fort Williams Committee. Sure. We're talking about things at Fort Williams. Sure. Can you talk a little bit more specifically? I know that one of the pictures you brought up was from Fort Williams. Sure. Can you talk just a little bit more specifically about the problem there and how we may need to factor that into planning overall for the fort and things like that? Well, sure. Um, I don't think, uh, I, I could be wrong, I think this is the first year that the uh, Fort Williams has been attacked by winter moth, and if it's not the first year, it's the second year. Um, what I saw this year in Fort Williams if that, again, if that was all that happened, if that's all that Winter Moth did, those trees would not die. Um, my suggestion there would be, um, and I was gonna do this, was put up some banding there. And so when you have a grove of trees, what can happen with the banding um, is that the, they can go from tree to tree. So if you ban one in a grove, you, you need to ban them all to, um, you know, so they're not jumping from tree from one tree that has a band to another. So, um, uh, they, you know, the infestation is there. Um, some level of integrated pest management does need to be levied there, but you're not going to have next year. You're not going to have dead oaks because of winter long. And in my opinion, in the next couple of years, you're not going to have um, dead trees. From it's a question of winter activity. Um, if we have an extremely cold November and December, chances are the winter moths aren't really going to be that concentrated or that bad. Uh, if we have warm days, uh, it could be greater because that's when they're doing their, uh, their mating cycle. Um, you can't backtrack from band after the fact, so I believe in being proactive there. But um, I also believe that uh, they're relatively safe at this point. You're not going to have trees that are going to die this year or next year. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Anybody else? Just, just one Go more ahead. quick point yep. to Councilor Jordan's question. The uh, accept acceptable trees that, are, uh, that the town recommends are identified in the subdivision ordinance, uh, page 45 and 46. So when uh, projects do come forward and they do uh, need to do plantings, they do have a list of trees that are acceptable within the town uh, right there, so it's readily available, so folks can, can look at that. It's a fairly extensive list, so uh, if, if people need to have it, that's where they, they do it. And I know the planner and the planning board review that fairly extensively, too, to make sure that they, they have the appropriate trees versus oaks and maples that have traditionally been planted. So Good. just Thank as a follow-up. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. Very, guys. very good stuff. Good to meet you. The information. All. Likewise. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on. Uh, next is the review of the draft minutes of the August 14th meeting. We'll be looking for a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Patty, is there a second? Thanks. Second. Penny, any discussion? Jessica. Yes. <clears throat> on item uh, 112. 19 Wells Road Tower Overlay District Zoning Map Amendment. And it shows one abstention, Councilor Penelope Jordan. Uh, this is a question for the clerk, Deb Lane. Technically, according to Town Council rules, we cannot abstain. Councilor Jordan was essentially not voting because she had recused on the same item at a prior. So my, my concern is could we change that to more accurately reflect reflect what actually Absolutely. was the reason. Okay, thank you. Yep. Good catch, thank you. Any other comments or discussion? 
I, I just I said good catch. Any other comments or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of um, approving the minutes of the August 14th meeting as amended uh, by Council Sullivan. Great, thank you very much. Next up is item number 121-2017, domestic foul amendments. We've got several ordinance things coming up. Patty, I assume you'll be introducing most of these? Yes, I will. There you go. Um, so just by way of background, you might remember um, that earlier this year, the council received complaints from a citizen regarding neighbors' chickens continually getting into their yard. So in July, the council referred this issue to the Ordinance Committee for review and asked the committee to draft amendments to regulate domestic fowl. Uh, we discussed possible amendments at two August meetings and decided to propose amendments to the Miscellaneous Offenses Ordinance Chapter 12. Um, this would regulate owners of domestic fowl to keep their animals off private property unless they had permission. Uh, we received input from Chief Williams um, and as well, the yeah. amendments were reviewed by town attorney John Wall. Um, so I'm sure that the council may have some questions. Um, I'm happy to put a motion on the table, Jamie, whatever, however you'd like me to propose to move forward. Uh, please. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, great. So I move that the council approve item number 121-2017, the domestic foul amendments, chapter 12, miscellaneous offenses. Is there a second? Caitlin? Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I, I think we need to, um, uh, for the council be uh, to move okay. into a public hearing for next month, and then uh, and then you can have oh, the final action. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Public hearing first, because it's uh, an amendment. Oh, yeah. to the okay. Hearing. I did make my motion for next month for public hearing. Yes, yeah, You're for, right. For both okay, so let me let me change that. So I move that the council uh, move um, these um, amendments to next month to the was it October 11th. Yep. Yes. 2017 Wednesday. meeting. Wednesday the 11th. Um, the domestic foul amendments, chapter 12, miscellaneous offenses um, for a public hearing. Caitlin, would you like to second again? Second. <laughs> Thank you. Any discussion? You. I had just a couple questions. Sure. And I know you were just talking about moving it to public hearing, but um, my questions have to do with what's the process or recourse if. Um, the foul shows up on somebody's lawn. Because that is really what was the challenge in previously, is that it took three calls and pictures and a lot of different things in order to try to have something occur. So it's like, how many complaints do you have to have? Is there anything that the police can do to remove animals? What is the recourse? if this were to occur. Yeah. Well, I think that when we talk to Chief Williams, I think that they, the, the big thing that they do is try to really work with property owners and kind of come through the air thing. But this, what this was able to do is um, give them some, some teeth into the ordinance so that they could come through and, and lay the law down saying that it's not to be in someone's yard, that we're getting a complaint. So I think before it was, the, the, it was a little more open-ended, so, and didn't specifically say, because there was a list of animals, it mm -hmm. wasn't in there. So now it just says animals, there's no list, so it gives it a little more taste to say this, the chickens are actually covered. And, and within that as well, there, there are specific provisions that are within the law uh, at the state level that are related to, uh, that are related to farm animals. That, uh, mm -hmm. and, and part of the problem that we had this summer was uh, we, the chief was looking at under municipal, uh, sorry, under, under the miscellaneous offenses form of category. And then in, in this one instance, the, the, the chicken owner uh, found that there are state laws that say, well, you have to do, they have to be violating mm -hmm. this law X amount of times within a 30 day period. Right. And the clock starts here and it ends here and the person was saying you, you can't you can't bother me uh, unless you have these documents. So this will take care of that challenge. So, so this ends up putting it more on the municipal level where you can say, okay, we have a you know it's, it's it, it really regulates everything except dogs and we already have dogs under a separate area, mm -hmm. but it gives the municipal authority to say, Okay, we can respond a lot more rapidly now to when you have an issue such as this or so a person uh, you, know, you have the person who's offended or uh, uh, who's impacted by it, and you have the impacting person.
person, if you will. So the person who's impacted by it doesn't have to wait uh, while someone else may not be being responsible uh, okay. with an animal that's, that needs to I be I think that's the key point for me is that wait time. That was like ludicrous. It was very frustrating for, for mm -hmm. the property owner who was who was having the problem, right. as well as, quite frankly, our law enforcement folks as well, who are trying to find a solution for all parties so they can, you know, it's okay. trying to get everybody to get along. <laughs> Other comments, discussion, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of referring the recommended ordinance changes to public hearing on Wednesday, October 11th, 2017. Great, thank you very much. Next up is item number 122-2017, polystyrene foam and single-use carryout bag ordinance changes, new ordinance. Patty? Yes. Okay. Oh. I think Patty and I are accused of this. I think we have to get it. You I get, I had a quite. <laughs> um, we're not going to be able to take action then tonight. If you both are recused, we already are. We've already been. No, I know, but because uh, since we, we won't have quorum. Yes. You'll have one, two, three, four. That's Don't you need five? Oh, you'll be okay. With we have four out okay. of seven. We're all right. We okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought you needed five. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Point. I, I don't recall that Councilor Penny Jordan was your kids. I recall that Councilor Kayla Jordan was, but. I said, uh, Penny refused yeah. herself, and then you yeah. said since Penny was off, I had to Right. Okay. I, I, I uh, talked to Matt earlier today because I had a question about the about recusal because I have a whole bunch of questions about about this, and I go, okay, I've got questions, and I think they're questions that general population might want to have answers to. So my question that I'll put forth to my peers is that. Can it's like we're talking about a potential five cents. Is that enough that it would cause a um, recusal? It's like is that a monetary thing that would cause a recusal? Because I would get five cents for a bag when somebody came into my store. So go ahead. Do I just? Well, I. I accepted initially your thought that the recusal was in order, but I wasn't frankly all that convinced because this is not, to me, this is not a, it, it's a collection that mm -hmm. I don't know where, and here's a question, I don't know where it goes. I don't see this as a, as a profit issue. It's, you'd have to supply the you plastic are. bags for which you would charge. I don't know how that's handled. I, I don't really see that as rising to the level. I, I didn't eat earlier, but you know, I, I went along with it. But I've thought about it since then. In the recommended language, the, the charge for the single use bag would go to whomever the business owner is for their use, however they deem okay. they want to use it. Lawful yeah, purpose. any lawful purpose. So that's where the money goes if okay. you're collecting it. Okay. Just just as a thought on this, Mr. Chairman, uh, maybe one approach to this could be for both Councilors Jordan to have the discussion with the Council and say, you know, if they feel that they can be objective in this, and then the Council, you know, they can identify that they, that to the Council that they may be, you know, the, the perception of a conflict of interest, but, uh, but they feel that they can be objective regarding this uh, with such an ancillary amount that you're looking at, especially with, like, in Council Penny Jordan's case, you're looking at the, most of the bags that you're using at the farm stand, for instance, are, are exempted within this language because you're using the, the non-handled plastic bags to bag, you know, like beans or something along those lines, and those types are specifically exempted within the ordinance versus the bags that you're going to get if you go to Cumberland Farms or Pond Cove IGA, uh, which have the handles in the more traditional sense. But maybe the, you know, to be so bold as City Council may want to just have a discussion if they feel that both councilors can be uh, can ex you know, exercise their duties as council members in an objective format, and then if they feel that they can, then really it's a I mean, so 
quite honestly, I don't think other council members are going to be making their income from selling plastic bags. It'll be mostly from what goes into the plastic bag. No. Thanks for, for lack of better yeah. And I would add that Caitlin did recuse herself from the committee. Jamie was so kind as to uh, step in in her stead, but um, she did participate as a citizen. And in fact, her input was actually quite helpful. So um, on, on you know the, this issue. So I mean, uh, again, I, I'll leave it to the council at this point if they want to do that. But I think that would. Um, but I think if you have the discussion that council decides that they can go forward, then you, I think you're meeting the intention of what the conflict uh, statute may, may require. Um, I, I was going to bring up the point that you just did, Patty, but actually in the opposite regard, the opposite. just for <laughs> consistency. It, it seems odd to me to have been, to have gone through the process of drafting the language, um, having, having, you know, done so under those circumstances and then and then to at this point change from that. Just one second. Um, I agree with you that Caitlin's input when offered as a citizen and non-participant as of the committee okay. was valuable. And what I actually wonder um, to the point that Penny's making is whether or not we should, um, we should offer that opportunity here, but that potentially they're not voting on it as a result. You know, so we, we, we get your input, we hear what you have to say. I, you know, I, I value it given that you're both people that would be directly impacted by this. But, you know, by, um, you know, by virtue of our, our standards around, around conflicts and, or potential conflicts that um, we not have either of your vote on it. That's, that's my thought, but I don't know. Jessica, are you going to add something else? Well, I, I, I think there are several ways to look at it. I, and I, I, I don't see this as an issue that is going to create significant income for any party in town. It, it's, it could be viewed as a burden. Yeah, my point actually isn't about the income so much. You know, it's just I, about yeah. the, the impact, yeah. you know, um, and being something that they're directly affected by. But. Um, and again, my bigger point is around the consistency. I mean, we went through multiple well, months of, yeah. of ordinance committee meetings with the decision one way, so. I just Go ahead. To, to point to that, though, I only had to, and I don't even remember recusing myself, I just didn't show up because I was told that because there was a recusal from town council, that automatically recused me off. So I never officially recused myself no, I didn't off, know that. Of council, off of ordinance. I was just told not to come. I, I didn't know that. Dude, I'm just saying, so it's not like one happened just because the other right. happened. But so I think that, that it was because the one happened, the other one automatically happened. Exactly. I, did, I did check with our staff, Maureen, and make sure that that was the proper process. So that's where we got that. Jessica? Well, I think your point about consistency is very well taken. Mm -hmm. And um, I would be in favor of continuing the status quo on this issue. But I certainly would like to hear from both counselors, Jordan, as to their citizen view. Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? Okay. So do we, so we took a vote way back when, right. I remember, about you recusing yourself. Right. I, it sounds like we've not formally done so with Caitlin. Should we do that for? No, we did. Oh, we did. Okay. It was Never. the ordinance. Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm just okay. saying one led to the other. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. Do you want to return to introducing the item? I will do. Okay. We do. Well, I think both counselors need to step down. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. And then you have join the audience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want I want Patty to introduce it first, and then I know we've got people to talk about. It, so. Okay. And then we'll make sure you guys like. Okay. So. Um, so by way of background, so, oh, well, so that's, you, you said to yeah. do that first. This way, we, I think they we both forward. started to move, and then you're like, well, we want to No, I thought you were talking about people from the audience speaking. <laughs> Never mind. Go okay, ahead. I think we can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So at our December 12, um, 2016 meeting, the council referred to the ordinance committee a review of a recommendation by the recycling recycling committee to consider two specific items. The first is a potential ban on the use of polystyrene foam packaging, also known as PS foam, um, and a possibility of regulating single-use carryout bags in Cape Elizabeth. So in July, the Ordinance Committee began the conversation on these two recommendations, 
where the recycling committee gave a well-researched, knowledgeable presentation. Um, next, we spent time reviewing amendments to the Health and Sanitation Ordinance, Chapter 11, and we did this at our July 11th, August 8th, and August 15th meetings. Um, so let's begin um, this by talking about uh, the first item that it was of the two specific items, and that was um, a possible ban on polystyrene foam. So here's what we learned about PS foam packaging. Uh, PS foam waste and remnants have a lasting negative impact on the environment. PS foam is a pollutant and made up of styrene and benzene, um, both carcinogenic compounds. Because PS foam is a known pollutant, there are many good alternatives to foam packaging, and consequently many of the businesses and towns have already um, discontinued use of um, PS foam packaging and have already made some changes. Um, also, as well, our neighbors in Portland and South Portland have already banned polystyrene foam packaging. Um, so therefore, the Ordinance Committee recommends adding the amendments to Article 1, Foods and Food Service Establishments in the Health and Sanitation Ordinance, Chapter 11. The proposed Ordinance Amendments ban the use of PS foam, except for perishable food shipments and in an emergency. Um, so because these are looped together with this item, I'm going to go on to also talk about recommendation number two, which was a potential regulation on single-use carry-out bags in Cape Elizabeth. Um, so as I said earlier, the Recycling Committee brought forth this recommendation. They suggested a five-cent charge per single-use carry-out bag, plastic or paper, be required for all food stores. The rationale for this recommendation is based on a number of facts. Uh, the first is a charge for bags will help to reduce community waste volume. So interestingly enough, one of the, the um, statistics that they brought forth was that Hannaford, uh, when they implemented this charge, um, precipitated an 80% reduction in single-use bags in their food stores um, alone. So it's a pretty significant um, way of motivating people to kind of um, reduce waste. Second, these plastics are hard to recycle, as EcoMay no longer accepts plastic bags for recycling. Third, most businesses already in Cape Elizabeth are supportive of this change. Matt Faulkner, the Recycling Committee member, visited nearly every store in Cape Elizabeth um, to, uh, three times he did that. And he did this specifically to educate them, to hand out um, brochures, and to talk about these recycling initiatives. And last, the proposed amendments and charge for single-use carry-out bags is very similar to what is already in effect in South Portland and Portland. So people in Cape Elizabeth are pretty familiar with um, this, this charge and being asked um, about this charge. So the ordinance is written has sections listing purpose and definitions. Exemptions are given in case of local, state, or, re or federal emergency. There is a severability clause and a section on enforcement. We spent a good amount of time considering enforcement with number of violations which would trigger potential um, fines. Ultimately, we chose what we felt um, was enforcement clause that we thought was fair and in line with other ordinances. So the proposed ordinance amendments have been added, or could, excuse me, the proposed ordinance amendments could be added as a new Article 4 to the Health and Sanitation Ordinance and um, have been reviewed by Town Attorney John Wall, as was the first to ban uh, polystyrene. Um, so at this point, I can put a motion on the table. Um, I, we do have the Recycling Committee member, um, the chairs here, um, Kara Law, and incredibly knowledgeable, and as well Bob Melly. So we're happy to answer any questions. Jamie, you're part of it, and as well Kathy. So um, whatever, however you'd like me to proceed at this point. Um, why don't we um, pause there and uh, invite the public up for comment okay. before we get to a motion. Yeah. Um, so if there's anybody from the public that wants to talk about this. Um, but first, before you get up, Kate, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Kara, did you want to say anything? Did you want to add anything to what Patty already included? or? Is there anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, yeah, if you could just. Yeah. So, Kara Lavender Law, 31 Macaulay Road. Um, so, first of all, thank you, Patty. I think that was a very nice presentation summarizing the Ordinance Committee meetings. Uh, I did want to say that this came up at the request of Town Council in 2016. It was in support of one of its sustainability goals. The committee was asked to quote, consider banning all single-use plastic bags in retail establishments. So we added this to the goals of the committee in 2016, which was then chaired by Peter Fry, and we submitted the ordinances late in 2016, and then they were considered by the Ordinance Committee uh, in 2017. So that has remained one of our goals. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to add was that uh, since we submitted the proposed ordinances, um, EcoMaine, as Patty mentioned, has stopped uh, accepting plastic bags. And one of the reasons for that, for recycling, is that it gums up their automatic sorting equipment. And for folks in town now to, to actually recycle bags would require them to separate them and take them to grocery stores or big box stores that collect those separately. So it's sort of an added um, step in order to try to recycle those. And since EcoBean has, has declared that they will stop accepting them, we are still seeing, Bob will tell you, uh, plastic bags and all the silver bullets and all of the recycling collection bins at the recycling center. So they continue to be a problem from a public work standpoint and a waste uh, processing standpoint, as well as you know the environmental concerns. Thank you. Thanks very much. Caitlin. <laughs> I'm just Caitlin Jordan, A3 Old Ocean House Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. I'm trying to follow the tracking of the food establishment definition changes. Um, it says under this ordinance that food establishment shall not include businesses that solely involve the packaging and shipment of live shellfish or raw fruits and vegetables, vegetables or fruits. I'm assuming that's to try and exempt the farm stands, but in my opinion, it doesn't quite cover it. Raw fruits and vegetables at farm stands we sell, cooked jams, pickles, those wouldn't be covered and wouldn't fall under that. Also, um, fish products are not live self shellfish, so I'm not sure if that would, if the intention is to try and exempt fish and farm markets because those are separate and items in our other ordinances, I'm not sure that the wording of that quite covers it similar to the wording we had, you had to adjust in a different section at your ordinance meetings. Just to follow along, yeah. you're talking about, yeah, I'm trying to find it. Um, I think it's page four of the PDF, page two of the actual markup, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Penelope Jordan, 21 Wells Road. Um, I have just a couple of um, sort of general questions. One of them, um, and, it, and it can really cover both the uh, styrofoam as well as the bags. Um, if, for example, an organization is having uh, food trucks or food vendors coming into town for an event, does it require that those uh, those one event vendors would not be allowed to use styrofoam and would not and would have to charge for bags? So that's covered in here. Yeah, an example we gave just to answer the question was actually the the um, employee uh, appreciation event that yeah. was at Fort Williams yeah. back in August. Yeah. Um, if this was in effect then, yeah. like the plates and things that we were using exactly. there would have would not have been allowed. Okay. So we would have, the the vendor that was doing the service food service for that event would have had to bring right. different materials. Yeah. Which example. says there will be a you know education issue for organizations so that uh, they let vendors know that yep. that's Go ahead, needed. Patty. And that was actually talked about is with this, not only if we were to approve a ban that the recycling committee already has it in their plans to spend time education, uh, being proactive to reach out to mm -hmm. vendors who would be doing that to say, this is what the policy is, here's mm -hmm. what you can use and, and try to make sure that it was um, really a, a multi you know, prong approach to making this be effective. Okay. My other question has to do with um, why does this just apply to food stores and food vendors? There are other types of retail establishments in, in many towns and in Cape Elizabeth that sell items that put the items in a plastic bag with a handle. The, for example, like the Fort Williams store, or we talked about this briefly. And, we, and Kara, we landed. Can you remind me why we landed on going? Because this is what the other communities have done. Yeah, so in large part we... Can you come back up, Karen? Sorry. No. But, okay. Just so everybody can hear. Yeah. Uh, 
so when we created the proposed ordinances, we largely followed Portland and South Portland. And I think the reason that that language is in South Portland especially is because of the main mall. That's what I thought. And taking on, um, you know, clothing retailers and all that kind of a thing. They're also largely using more thicker, more reusable bags. Whether or not people reuse them is a valid question, but they t a lot, many of them tend to use thicker bags. But the uh, idea being that most of these single-use bags, specifically the plastic ones, are coming out of food establishments. Mm -hmm. So that's, we, we basically adopted the language from the other ordinances. Mm -hmm. We also, in inventorying the retailers in town, I, I, I think there was almost nothing that fell outside of that though, right? I mean, literally the, the gift shop at Fort Williams was this one that I remember coming out. on Shore Road, a clothing. But um, that aren't used. That are not food establishments. Right, but I also don't think that they're using those types of bags Anyway, uh, did, sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the committee would be perfectly happy for town council to broaden the scope of it. Uh, you know, this was again just sort of following what had been done. No, it's a fair. It's a fair point. Yeah. Uh, I, I think. I think it was my recollection from the meetings. It was more through the lens of what what do we have currently. But that's a fair point. And where are the prospects? Yes. Yeah. Right, and, and I understand that, and I think my only point is that to take and say only certain establishments will have to adhere to this versus all retail establishments, I just throw that out there as it's kind of, uh, I, and I understand why South, South Portland didn't want to take on the main <laughs> mall. I understand that totally. But. Any other public comment? Okay, based on that, Patty, I don't know what, okay. what your intent is for a motion, whether or not you're interested in referring it to... Well, I, we could put, potentially put this to a workshop to address specifically that question, and we could ask um, Maureen. I, I wouldn't think it would be very tricky to put the adding a retailer in here, but I would, as we've done in other times, when we start to throw in something that affects other pieces, I would hate to... Well, that's what my question is, is yeah. whether or not it needs to go back to the ordinance committee or a workshop. And my, my lean is to back, back to, as much as I'd like to move this forward, <laughs> I, I, think, I think the appropriate step is to go back to the ordinance committee. Okay. So let's find out if, that's, if there's an agreement yeah. to, uh, within the four councils that are sitting here that that makes sense based on what they heard. Um, I tend to think if that's the feeling is that um, there's a, a, ver a viable question with the perishable and as well adding retailers. Um, we could do that. I think this is time sensitive, certainly, in any way, shape, or form, and we could send it back. Is that to what other counselors? Well, I'd, I'd suggest making a motion, and then we'll discuss. Okay. So. All right. So, um, well, I have two ways. Do we can either move it to the public hearing, or we can go to a workshop um, council? My recommendation would be to refer it back to the ordinance committee. Okay. So, but. all right. So let's do that. So then I move that um, we. Um, that we move to move this um, conversation regarding uh, potential ban on, actually, um, so let's do this. I'm going to do this. On behalf of the Ordinance Committee, I move to set a public hearing for Wednesday, October 11, 2017 for the proposed amendments to the PS phone. Do we feel like we could do that? No. Go ahead, Council. Yeah, I don't, I don't think... I w wouldn't think you'd want to do that. You would, wouldn't think you would. No, I. Well, uh, keep it you, together. I would take them both back to ordinance committee. Okay, great. Right. I think, yeah, because they're all under the same chapter eleven health and sanitation okay. area, and the language is fairly well married to each other. It may be, it may be cleaner, I guess, Councilor Grant, to, to to go that route if you, okay. if you so choose. So I move that we. Um, can, actually, before, I'm sorry, before you make your motion, when is the next ordinance committee meeting? We didn't have one because we, um, so we could schedule one, which is typically there the Tuesday after. Um, this meeting, we, I can certainly reach out, Jamie and Kathy, and set something up in the next um, few weeks. We didn't have one scheduled at all. I, I, the reason I'm asking the question is, is it possible to, with one stone hit, scheduling an ordinance committee to deal with the questions that have been raised but simultaneously setting a public hearing for 
the 11th so that we have new language that's being brought forth out of the ordinance committee for that. But Based on history, I would say yes, because um, I'm here, Kathy seems to be, um, have been readily available when asked, um, and as well, you, I think we could probably make this happen uh, for a meeting, so I, I think we could do that. Um, again, Jessica, you would have good thoughts usually. Well, I, I don't, doesn't the council have to approve exactly what goes to the public hearing. So it seems to me that you wouldn't be doing this. You wouldn't. We would have a discussion on the next town council meeting and a public hearing in the room. Okay. Because so it makes sense. Okay, so we need to move this back to the ordinance committee. So I, um, at this point, I will move to um, direct the conversation regarding um, the ban on PS foam, as well as the, the potential single-use carry-out bag um, charge back to ordinance co uh, committee for consideration for the two um, items that were brought up this evening. Is there a second? Yeah. Kathy, <coughs> discussion? All those in favor? All right, thank you. Item number 123-2017, general assistance appendices. Matt? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is, uh, as many council members may recall, this is an annual occurrence uh, that comes about this time of year. The town receives recommendations from Maine Municipal Association for uh, revisions that take place uh, to the general assistance qualifications and uh, different language, so this is an annual event. Uh, we did receive that uh, recently and it's looking to uh, help us out with our uh, following standards going forward. Great. Is there a motion? Uh, I have a point of information. Yep. This also would go to public hearing, would it not? And I believe you do that. Yes, yeah, it's just so, go to public hearing in October, and then you can act on it uh, that, that evening afterwards if you want to move forward. But I mean, we need to, uh, okay. it'll be effective October 1st till next uh, September. So. Um, so we would we would uh, vote to incorporate the recommendations and set a public hearing for October 11th, yeah, for October 11th. and then vote on accepting it permanently that night. Yeah, yeah. Okay. we'll have we'll have it as a second mm -hmm. second item that we'll have uh, after the event. Generally, that's a safe approach. It's not there are the significant so controversial fair. elements <laughs> in there, so it's a housekeeping issue on an annual basis. So does anybody want to make a motion? Jessica? I move that we uh, accept the changes to our general assistance uh, ordinance appendix. Is that, I think, is that the correct? Appendices. Appendices. Yeah. <clears throat> and that we set this to a public hearing for the October 11 town council meeting. Is there a second? A second. Penny, any discussion? Yeah, I have a question. Question, um, Kathy. I think this has happened before in the past. Do we normally send it to a public hearing? Um, because I noticed it says on here "adopt," and I, you know, we can do whatever you want, but I, you know, I do. We usually send it to a public hearing. I believe that we do. I believe so. Deb, do you remember? It's been done both ways. The state just wants to ensure that public notice was made, which it was. The the uh, agenda has been out. But the council's done it both ways, so certainly sending it to public hearing is appropriate as well. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. Item number 124-2017, provisions for use of the Spurwink Church. To this up, Mr. Chairman? Uh, sure. First, I want to say thank you to Deb Lane for, for doing a uh, ton of work on coming up with these revisions. Uh, as, as the council may recall, Janet Hannigan, who had been our, our church greeter uh, for the Spurling Church over the past 20 plus years uh, this summer, uh, decided to pass uh, her, her authorities on uh, or, or go in, and pursue other activities. And uh, so she has stopped doing that position. Uh, Deb, Bob, uh, and I had the opportunity to take Janet out last week for lunch and thank her for her years of service because she couldn't make it to the employee appreciation uh, luncheon in August. 
Uh, the job is currently being done by her uh, daughter-in-law, Teresa. Uh, but we took the opportunity uh, to sit down and uh, take a review of what we have for current policies and procedures. Uh, I thought it would be a good time to take a look at some of those challenges that we may have faced and reflect on that. We met with Teresa Hannigan as well. Deb has had numerous conversations with Janet over the years to, to see what we can improve on those policies and procedures when it comes to the ch use of the church. Uh, so what you see here is uh, a number of those kind of clarifying and cleaning up some of the language. Uh, the town worked with uh, John Wall as well to review uh, some of those contract provisions that we have. That are within uh, that are within there. Some of them is, uh, are as varied as uh, you know protecting the town in case we do need to uh, to cancel uh, uh, you know an event due to something that may see we didn't have protections before the, in the prior uh, in the prior uh, language, uh, but we did have we did run into an issue this summer where we had a couple. Of, uh, it was close to having a double booking that took place and it got a little too cozy, and that's why we've also spelled out to a greater extent. Uh, if, you know, if you have two events on the same day, what your what your window is for uh, doing your event, and then the subsequent event and where they're at as well. So, uh, that's the hope here is to have an improved document that that can you know suit us for the next let's hope for the next 20 years with Teresa doing the job as well. So, and as well, there is a couple of clarifications in there as far as the, the fees that are charged. Uh, like you see that the viewing fee has, has been increased to forty dollars. And then the parking attendant fee is no longer in there because we're not, we're not going to be providing that as a service. Okay. What's that mean about the parking attendant? I'm just asking as a, a butter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then what, what were we thinking about the, with the parking? I think there, there'll be self-parking. There'll be self-parking, right. Um, before the event, Teresa will explain to the renters and then she will also, um, if they have any questions at the rehearsal, uh, they can go over the parking. But it generally hasn't been a problem. What's been more a problem is getting people as parking attendants. Um, and we're not really sure who does that. And, and so we just decided, and we've talked about this for a while now, um, that self-parking is probably the best, best approach. Thank you. Thank you. And the one thing we did find during this whole analysis was that our, our volume was down quite a bit as far as uh, small church weddings, as you saw in Deb's, Deb's memo. There's a, you know, there's been more of a uh, impetus going towards the, you know, the barn style wedding versus the small church wedding. But we're looking to find ways that we can inspire people to to come back uh, to do that. But we're awfully close to, well, actually, we're, we're we will. You know the, what we what it costs us to operate the building annually is not met by the amount of revenue we receive, at least specific to weddings. But the numbers the numbers are down a bit. But we'll see that could come back. It could be a cyclical a cyclical thing. Jessica, I move that we approve the amendments to the provisions for use of the Spring Church. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Patty, any discussion? Caitlin. Is it common, having never had to look for a wedding venue, to have to pay for a showing? I mean, we're charging $40 just to look at the church. Might be why we don't have a lot of people wanting to get married, maybe. Um, just, and then oh, my other question was, what is the reason why you can't throw even artificial flowers or petals or anything I mean, if you're going to have a little church wedding, everybody wants a little flower girl, so maybe we're not helping ourselves in selling the church that well if you, you know, can't have the flower girl at your wedding. But it's going to clean up. Right, but I mean, if you put it on, the, the wedding, already in the rules, it says that you have to clean up everything, so, or you forfeit your deposit. So I was just curious what the rationale was for why you, you know, I can see rice and birdseed and confetti, that's, I hassle it. It takes out rose, adds all flower petals, because I imagine somebody tried to skirt around that rule before, and then you can't throw any flowers down the aisle. Is being added. I'm just curious what. I thought it was that we ran into this as an issue it, back in the day. It in the and, yeah, look, it's it's uh, done in the carpet, embedded in the carpet as well. Oh, yeah, some of them actually stay in the carpet, depending on yeah. the carpet's down. So yeah. it's a protection for uh, maintenance of the 
Yeah. It's carpet. carpet. Yeah. I didn't realize it was carpet. I just assumed. Mm, wood Maybe hardwood. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, underneath the carpet, but. Right. Yeah. That explains it. I was just curious. You know, those are two things that would. Yeah. And for the church um, showing, it is uh, the church coordinator's time that they go well, out, you know, to meet. So. Um, I figured that was the reason. I was just curious, industry standards, how standard it is to charge just to look at a venue, I guess. I, my sense is that, that those fees, if they're not specifically listed at other venues, that they're embedded in the fees because they're quite a bit higher. If you look at these fees, they, yeah. they Which are I, I understand they're low, but I'm just saying if, if I'm looking for a wedding venue, and I've got five churches to pick from, and I've got to pay $40 just to look at this one, I might not even bother to come look at it, which is why our wedding revenues are down, maybe. I'm not sure. I'm just saying, it, after, I have no idea. I'm just after sure. talking with Janet and Teresa, who has helped Janet over the years, the fees do not seem to be uh, even really mentioned uh, when somebody is, decides not to book the church. As Matthew says, it's really alternative sites. Um, it started out years ago with kind of the destination weddings. Um, frankly, when In by the Sea started doing weddings, um, a lot of people were doing the weddings and the receptions right at In by the Sea. And I'm not blaming them. It's a wonderful <laughs> thing to have everybody right there. But literally, there were um, ceremonies that took place at the In by the Sea that generally would have taken place at the church and then maybe the reception at the end. And then the last couple of years, it's been that people want these barn weddings. And those are literally things that people have told Janet and now Teresa uh, when they're looking that these are the other options that they're looking for. And um, so they, those are some of the reasons why they choose. And, and fees have not been, at least to this point, um, one of the factors in not having a, a wedding at the church. And, and interesting enough, oftentimes we may be a secondary location. So they may have a, you know, a water, like a, a beach wedding planned or on the rocks on the coast, and then they book this as a backup, so you know, they'll be high and dry. Uh, so we had a couple of different events this year that we were in, the facility didn't get used on that day, but they did have the peace of mind, so it's, it, as far as the cost, I think it's fairly uh, conservative if they mm -hmm. look at that, versus what you, if you were going to an event facility. Any other questions, comments? Kathy? Yeah, um, I'm a little bit um, on board with Caitlin's uh, question. Uh, well, first of all, um, this is on the agenda, and that's fine. Um, but I, what I was a little bit confused about was who asked for it to be on the agenda. And usually, when something is on the agenda, it says um, so and so or such and such. The town manager or so and so asked for this to be on the agenda. <clears throat> for me, that's a little bit helpful. Because if I have a question in advance, then I can call that person and say, you know, can you tell me about this? So I'm just making that suggestion uh, that if there's something on the agenda that w we say who's asked for it. I, I, I'm not a criticism, sure, just, sure. A, you know, helps me. Um, the other thing is, is um, I'm sort of a little bit where Caitlin is. Um, I understand about, you know, we don't want um, things thrown and not picked up. But do we have, uh, if somebody wants to say throw petals or I don't know, whatever they want to throw, do we have something that says that they could, they would be required to clean it up or pay a fee to have it cleaned up? I mean, is that, I'm just asking these questions to sort of try to get, you know, get an understanding. I think, you know, again, going to some of the petals can stain the carpet. That's a concern. If you have two events on one day, is there enough time for somebody to get in there and clean and vacuum? And is the wedding party or someone directed, you know, from the wedding party going to want to stay back and do that to clean that church to have it? Because if it's a uh, two events in that same day, there's not a lot of time for the vendors for the second wedding to come in and start setting up. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's in there vacuuming and cleaning up and trying to get stains out, if it's a you know, a damp, rainy day, and people's shoes are wet, and then they're stamp, you know, stomping on whatever, whatever might have been yeah. thrown on the floor. That might be an issue. Um, and it might not look nice for the next uh, event. See, I'm sort of a little bit with Caitlin on this. Um, 
um, I've lived in that neighborhood for 23 years. And it used to be that you had to book this place two years in advance. And every weekend in the summer, you'd have three, two or three weddings, you know, ding, 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 all, you know, all weekend long. And I understand, you know, and I get it that, you know, people want to do the beach and the barn and stuff like that, but being old enough to understand that ch things change back and, you know, we're not wearing um, bell bottoms anymore, but we might. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, we may go back the other way and I, I, I'm, you know, again, I'm not being critical, but I'm just wondering, I don't want to make it so that it's not something that we're trying to entice people to do. Um, I, I hear what you're saying about the whole, you know, pedals and so forth, and I, I don't know, I, I'm just a little unsure. Um, you know, I'd like it to be, you know, a place where people want to go, you know, a small church in a little town, and, you know, 10 years from now, people might be like, oh, I want to be married in church. I, I don't know, but um, I, I don't know. I'm just a little not sure, so anyway. I think Deb wanted to respond to me. Yeah. No, I'm just going to say these prohibitions were in in the heyday, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. We've just kind of tweaked them. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. But I understand what you're saying. It just, you know, again, we and, and the council can do, you know, what what you feel is best. But we're just right. trying to contact right. the facility as well. And and the other the other piece is that we have listed the uh, okay. parties renting the Spurwink ch Church called the town representative. We've listed a name. Um, Maybe that's, maybe that's where we want it because this is on the website and this is what people pick up and then they do that, but we don't usually uh, list names and just in case, um, like we say, they call the town representative and I don't know, is, there's not a general number. This is somebody's personal number. Is that how that works? This goes right to uh, the church coordinator number that, that she has set up just for. Are you talking about on the form itself? Or Pardon? are you talking about on the form itself or um, on the No, I'm talking about just in the policy. Uh, on the for, policy. Yeah, for, the, for the, the policy. So, you know, um, we say call the town representative. We don't list the name. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I wish uh, Janet was there, but, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm just wondering if we should have a name on the policy. The form, yeah, that I get that, but. I'm just on page three at the end. Yep, yep, at the very end, just about the organist. On page uh, you know, I'm I'm not throwing myself on the sword here. I'm just no, no, I'm just question. We yeah. do list Teresa's name and number on page three of the provision. Yes, right. right. Okay, that's, a, that's fine. That's fine. I think the, the which I understand exactly what Kathy's saying. It, it can be more generalized if you just say uh, in the the policy part of the guidelines or whatever you want to call them. Well, to call the town representative. Yep. <coughs> if you folks would like to change that, yes, mm. certainly you could do that. And then on the form, you have the person's name. Right. Mm -hmm. You could change that if you folks want. Yeah, that's what I was just trying to say, just so you didn't. I, was I thought you were saying the opposite, that she wasn't included. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah that's all right. Sorry about that. Saying. Thank you, Penny, <laughs> Penny clarified. <laughs> it makes sense. <coughs> Any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor of uh, accepting the proposed amendments to the provisions of use of the Spurwink Church with the revision that we just discussed? Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you, Deb, for coordinating that. Um, next up is item number 125-2017, updates to the board and committee supplemental documents. Mr. Chairman, this yep. has been uh, brought forward uh, as we move forward by the, at the request of the manager. How's that? There we <laughs> go. The fly, Councilor Ray. Uh, the, as we get uh, moving forward towards the appointments process, and uh, Deborah and I were speaking about this uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, noticing that there are multiple different documents that laid out the provisions for the appointment process and found that there was redundancy in certain areas where you have it identified in this form and in this form and this form, but you had. The, uh, you know, the, the, the responsibility of boards and commissions in there. So a lot of those points were covered in multiple different documents. So the effort here was to 
try to eliminate some of that redundancy and have this more uh, clearly stated where folks, if they were looking for guidelines as far as what the, uh, what the provisions may be towards the appointments process, that they would have kind of a one-stop shopping effort versus the multiple sources that they needed to look at in the past. That's so in many ways why we brought this forward this evening. Hopefully it'll make the appointments process easier uh, going forward. So largely just clean up and consolidation. Yes. Right? Yeah. Does anybody want to make a motion? Jessica. I move that we accept uh, the updates to the board and committee supplemental documents. Is there a second? I'll Kathy? Second. Any discussion? Jessica. Uh, on items 9 and 11, you've got a couple more words commissioned that need to be changed to committee. Okay. I mean, I, I, it's, yeah, I mean, a it's just a couple there. to pick up. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it's, it's tough there, you know. But yes, number 9, you see that one? It's the last word on number 9. The last word is commission. And you, I'm sure you want that to be committee. And also on number 11, you have com com two commission. Two commission, it, it reads twice, and I'm First sure you want sentence. that, those to be changed to committee. Yeah, there were a lot of committee commission. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> commitments up Well, there. We, we had the same issue last year in ordinance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we were continually catching. Sneaking <laughs> that out there. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the revisions at the uh, recommendation as revised, I should say. Great. Thank you very much. Next up, uh, number 126-2017, Municipal Election Warrant. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, uh, generally uh, the time of year where we end up setting the municipal election warrant. Uh, this is the intent behind this to let the pu general public know that on November 7, 2017, uh, there will be an election held in the town of Cape Elizabeth where there will be uh, voting on uh, council members as well as school board members as well as there will be the opportunity to, to weigh in on uh, state ballot uh, measures that come forward as well. Uh, so this is uh, the initiation of the process to move us forward so we can prosecute the election successfully. Great. <laughs> I'll entertain a motion to approve the warrant. What information do we have a copy of the warrant? Or what it reads? Yes. The warrant? Yes, it was in the, it was with the packet. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, was yeah, if it doesn't have the, uh, the, uh, it's the not candidates' on the... names on there. Yeah, but, but it's, okay. It should, uh, let's just double check there. Yep. Okay. Is there a motion? Sure. Oh, that, um, I move to approve item number 126-2017, um, municipal election warrant. Is there a second? Second. That. Penny, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. Um, next up is item number 126-2017, town manager evaluation. I'll entertain a motion to enter into executive session. Oh, yeah, it should be 127. Yeah, actually. Yeah, Thank, you. Thank you. I'll pick it up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Figure it out as we go. I, want, I just want to clarify. Um, so, if we vote to go into executive session, we're going to go into executive session. The citizen opportunity for comment is at the conclusion. Were you guys here to comment on this? Okay. The, the Red Sox game must not be very good. <laughs> Is there a motion to enter into executive session? Jessica. I move that uh, in conformance with 1 uh, MRSA section 4056A, we enter into executive session to continue the discussion of the evaluation of the town manager. Is there a second? I'll second that. Patty, any discussion? All those in favor? Great. Thank you very much. I'll let you know. Adjourn.